Welcome to this webinar on sexual health and the adolescent male. I'm Fred Wyan, Director of Communications with the American Sexual Health Association, ASHA, and I'll be moderating this activity, which was developed through an independent educational grant for Merck and Company. Taking care of young people can be a challenge since they often don't visit their health care provider on a regular basis, and this can especially be problematic with boys and young men. So during this activity, we'll cover a number of key sexual health topics and offer relevant counseling messages. And with each topic, there will also be a checklist of sample questions that can be used even for patients in the office for a simple sports physical. Not all of the questions will be appropriate for each patient, of course, but they're designed to encourage clinicians to challenge assumptions and be proactive in addressing what can be very sensitive topics around sexual health. So with that as background, I'll introduce our subject matter expert and presenter. Dr. J. Dennis Fortenberry is professor of pediatrics with the Indiana University School of Medicine, where he's the Donald Orr Professor of Adolescent Medicine and serves as Chief of the Section of Adolescent Medicine. He's also the former Chair of ASHA's Board of Directors and continues to serve faithfully, I'll add, as one of our primary medical advisors. Dr. Fortenberry, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to hand this off to you now, and we'll begin a discussion on building trust and rapport with young patients. Thank you, Fred. It's a critical place to begin in thinking about how to build trust with young men. It's easy to start with less personal things before moving on to some specific discussions around sex, relationships, and mental health. It's critically important to have these discussions with young people with their parents out of the room. Parents can be in the room at the beginning and at the end of discussions, but some private time with you is an important part, as well as letting the young person know that the things that you talk about are confidential. You can help parents with this by letting them know up front that at some point, you'll be asking them out of the room. It's important to talk about your privacy policy with the young person at the beginning. You can say things like, I'm obligated to respect your privacy and your confidentiality. The things that we talk about are between us and the only things that I would share are those that would concern me about your safety or the safety of others. And this slide that Dr. Fortenberry is showing, it goes to the healthcare provider section of ASH's website. And in addition to the pre-visit checklist for young males that you're seeing here, there are also companion documents for, for providers and a number of other tools as well. So we encourage you to click and check those out. They're all available for a free download. So next we're gonna talk about sexual health and relationships. And Dr. Fortenberry, when we were putting this activity together, I was struck by how early in adolescence we probably need to start thinking about having conversations about sex. Well, the important thing is to remember that almost all adolescents will have some kind of partnered sexual relationships during their adolescence, but there are earlier and later onsets of those activities. And it's important to be able to discuss those before those activities begin. So if you wait until someone's in high school, it may be too late. So there are some specific kinds of topics that you can address fairly explicitly and safely with young people. You can directly ask, what kinds of sex have you had with another person? You can ask if they're in a relationship with a person or with other people, and how do you feel about that person? How do you meet the people 
that you identify as either romantic or sexual partners? And where do you get information about sex from your school, from your friends, online? There are a lot of sources. As you talk about contraception and the prevention of unplanned, unwanted pregnancies, it's important to remember that your discussions about the topic don't encourage or give the appearance of permission to have sex, but it is quite clear that the lack of access to contraception and information about contraception is associated with pregnancy risk. And you see here some important information about the use of, of contraception in adolescence. And it's important to remember that those figures have increased over the past decade or so. With that, it's important to remember that some young people still don't reliably use condoms and other methods of contraception. So it's worth a discussion with every young person at every opportunity that you have. Young people still appreciate discussions about topics, about consent, about boundaries, about self-image, about peers. They are all important to them in making healthy choices about their sexuality and the prevention of pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections. Some of the specific things that you can address after you've established sexual activity and the importance of sexual of contraception is ask the young person what kinds of contraception they might be using. Have they talked about it? Do they know about things like emergency contraception? Is it something that you could offer them? Ask them how they have discussed protecting both the patient and their partner from sexually transmitted infections. And ask them specific questions about condom use, use with every kind of partnered sex, and even asking about things like, do you know where to get condoms and do you know how to use them? If not, there are some good online sources for how to use condoms correctly. Relationships themselves, with or without sex involved, are an important part of many young men's growth and development during adolescence. It's also a place where you can begin conversations about intimate partner violence and around issues of consent. And it's important to remember that this is a common experience of young people's lives, where at least 15% of young men who are victims of violence or who have perpetrated um, have that history. And many of these are never addressed by their clinicians. So it's an ideal age to begin that inquiry. You can explore other kinds of positive aspects of about relationships. Are these important relationships to you? Are they enjoyable? Are they good for you? You can do that in the context of exploring other kinds of violence and intimate partner violence experiences and raise the issues of, of consent, remembering that some of these disclosures may be mandatory reporting in your state. You raise a really good point. I mean, this is a timely discussion in an era where we're thinking more about consent and power dynamics and relationships and, and a couple of things. I mean, these can be issues at any age. It's not just something with you know, older or middle-aged folks. Uh, really, it can happen across the spectrum. And, you know, I think sometimes we tend to think about consent as being just, well, whether or not to have sex, period. But, you know, it's, it's, it's like your reference. It can be a, a consent is also an issue about whether or not to use birth control, uh, whether or not to use condoms. Uh, it can be what kinds of sex you know, one is willing to have, if they're willing to have sex at all. So there's, uh, you know, there, there's, there, there's a lot to that. So next we're going to talk about some issues around sexual orientation, gender identity, and the experiences of sexual minority youth.
this has become an area that a lot of practitioners have began to try to develop approaches in their own practices. It's important to remember, despite all of the negative experiences that many young sexual minority people will experience, that many are extraordinarily resilient, they're well adjusted, and they do well in their school and with their families. That being said, it is important to remember that a lot of these young people have experiences of bullying, they've had experience with dating or intimate partner violence, and they have substantially higher rates of depression and suicide attempts, as well as other health harming behaviors such as cigarette smoking, alcohol use, some forms of substance use, these are important consequences of one's sexual identity, especially as a sexual minority youth. You can do a lot in your practice to make the environment affirming and safe for sexual minority people, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans young people. You can include your practice in a referral database so that even before a young person comes to you, they understand that you recognize the importance of being safe and welcoming for sexual and gender minorities. You can be explicit in your practice about using gender neutral terms. For example, using the term partner rather than boyfriend or girlfriend when establishing relationships. You can make your practice visually welcoming and affirming. You can use safe space signals, posters or decals. You can get these online. You can use images throughout your office space that show same-sex couples and trans youth. It's critically important to train your staff to understand that this is a safe and welcoming space, to make sure that they have the reference and the practice to create welcoming environments since they're as important as you are in contributing to that experience for young people. Topics to explore related to sexual orientation, and it's important to remember that relatively few young people, even in safe youth-oriented practices are ever asked this. So your inclusion of this is important to your young patient's experience. You can ask, who are you attracted to? What genders are you attracted to? Who do you have sex with? What genders do you have sex with? What identities do you have? gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, or something else? What behaviors have you experimented with? You can ask, has anyone ever forced you or pressured you to have sex? And you can ask, has anyone ever given you a hard time or has bullied you because of your sexual orientation? Gender diverse people in your practice are people that unless they tell you, you have to be open enough to allow them to disclose this. And you can do this by asking them if the gender that they identify as is the same as the sex identified at birth or recorded on their birth certificate. Those two pieces of information help you identify within your practice those that may have issues in terms of their gender identity. And this is a critical place of creating a welcoming space for gender diverse and gender queer transgender patients. Again, visual clues can be critically helpful, including 
getting the young person's name and their pronouns correct. You can ask if a young person hasn't disclosed, do you see yourself as male, female, or some other gender? Do you have concerns about your gender or others in your world? Are there people that you can talk to about things like this? If you identify someone who's having those issues, you can explore the safety and trust they have for others in terms of this. It's important to remember that as long as specific reproductive organs are present, a person can still become pregnant or cause a pregnancy no matter what their gender expression and gender identity. So it's an important part to explore. Dr. Fortenberry, you use some terms like transgender, gender diverse, gender queer. Would you talk a bit more about the different, the, the, the wide array of gender identities? That those are a lot of terms. I'm not sure everybody is, you know, we're all on the same page in terms of how we define them. There are a basis for this, and that is the discrepancy or the difference between sex assigned at birth, which is typically male or female and is often recorded on one's birth certificate and becomes part of a legal, legal presence for all of us in terms of even basic things like citizenship, and going to school, and uh, getting a passport. And then there's gender identity, and that's the sense inside each of us of what our gender is. And for some of us, that is very much in concordance, that birth assigned sex and the expectations of gender for that. And for some of us, that is not in accordance, and there's a discrepancy there. And that's often a cause of some distress for young people that we call gender dysphoria. You also reference ways to make a practice welcoming and affirming, but you mentioned another word, uh, safety. And I, that to me, if somebody literally doesn't feel safe going to an institution or to a practice, that's a hard barrier. They just they just won't go. Would you just elaborate that uh, on that a little bit about the aspect of gender diverse persons feeling literally unsafe? Yeah, it's uh, it's been fairly well documented that a high proportion of gender diverse people have experienced either discrimination or have been refused care in healthcare settings, including primary care settings, emergency departments. So that very sense that just walking into a physician's office for many people is something that triggers some negative emotions because many are not clear what kind of reception they will receive based on their gender presentation. Okay. Let's talk a bit now about sexually transmitted infections and the tremendous, almost astonishing burden of these infections experienced with young people. Well, for many of us, it's important to remember that there are a huge number of sexually transmitted infections in the United States, and about half of them occur in people under the age of 24, and often occur within the first few months of a young person's first partnered sexual experiences. It's additionally important to remember that a high proportion of these infections are asymptomatic, and so only a small number of young people who become infected with one or more sexually transmitted infections are even tested for them. So they have the infection and don't know it. 
there are recommendations out there that all adolescents and adults should be tested at least once for HIV. There aren't good recommendations for how often during adolescence a young person should be tested, but certainly for people with high risk exposures in terms of condomless sex um, or other risk factors, they should probably be tested more often. There are not currently recommendations for screening regularly for other sexually transmitted infections such as chlamydia or gonorrhea. But again, for those who are at high risk or living in a high prevalence settings, those kinds of recommendations, um, screenings can take place. It is important to remember that regular screening for young women is recommended as long as they give a history of sexual exposure. So here are the kinds of things you can consider, particularly for young men who give a history of having partnered sex with other men. HIV, syphilis, gonorrhea and chlamydia. Remember other kinds of exposures in terms of receptive anal sex or receptive oral sex. Those are important things to clarify with your history. Things that you can explore with young men, including questions about what things are you doing to protect yourself and your partner against sexually transmitted infections, including HIV. This allows them to tell you about more than just using condoms or not using condoms. It lets you open up a variety of other things. You can ask about how they've been tested for sexually transmitted infections in the past, if they have. You can explore their understanding of how these infections are transmitted to try to identify myths that you may be able to fairly easily correct. And then you can ex specifically explore their experience with the human papillomavirus vaccine in terms of the number of doses that they've received, if any. You talked about the pretty clear guidelines, for example, with uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea around young women and, and testing, and that we don't really have, have those, the same level of evidence or the same guidelines with, with young men. Is, is the lack of the guidelines with young men, is that problematic? Do you think sometimes young men maybe fall through the cracks and that they're not tested enough and that they're not really not having these conversations with providers? It's not clear. The, I think sometimes because there aren't screening recommendations, providers think that it's not necessary to, to obtain the right kind of exposure histories and have the right kinds of discussions because it's, there's no clear push to to do testing and because and then there's no push to do the education so i think using the history to guide decisions either for discussions for education and then for indicated testing can be important it is useful to know however that part of the reason these aren't recommended is because at a population level, they haven't been shown to reduce the incidence of infection. At an individual level, they're critical parts of any given young person's health care that they receive from you. And on the healthcare provider page on the ASHA site I referenced earlier, there are some links to sexual history taking materials uh, for clinicians. Uh, so we'll make sure that we include that on the landing page for this, uh, for this webinar. So finally, we'll spend some time on the human papillomavirus, HPV. And there's been a lot of focus on this now that we're in, in the age of effective vaccines against the virus and vaccines that are recommended for, for males as well as females. Um, so we'll, I'll hand off to you and we'll start talking about HPV epidemiology. Yeah, HPV has really been an area where contemporary technology has, has 
been shown to be extraordinarily effective. It's important because HPV is common. There are different types. About 40 of them are known to be sexually transmitted and about 15 have some potential to cause cancers of different types, often genital and anal rectal cancers particularly. The fact that they're common is really important because it's useful to know that almost every sexually active person will acquire at least one HPV infection over the course of their lifetime and that those infections happen commonly in unvaccinated people and they may happen very soon after young people have their first partner exposure, sometimes at the first exposure, often within six months, half or more of young people who are unvaccinated may have had their first infection. And this is a big deal in terms of its cost, in terms of the HPV infections themselves and the consequences of HPV infections. It's common in young men as well, and in at least a cohort of slightly older men uh, from this particular study, half of the men had at least one HPV infection and over the course of a given year, new and about 40% of the men had a new inf infection with a, at least one HPV. These are viruses that are common but are primarily transmitted through sexual intercourse, but almost any kind of genital contact can transmit. Condom use is important in reducing HPV transmission, but it may not be fully protective because areas of the skin that are infected may not be uh, covered by the condoms. It's important to remember that in the United States today, the head and neck cancers associated with HPV may be the most important consequence of HPV infections with significant rise in the incidence of oral pharyngeal cancers, particularly in men. Many of those infections can't be detected after a period of initial detection. And it's the persistence of some of the types, particularly HPV types 16 and 18, that are associated with cancers of the anus, penis, oropharynx, and other genital organs. Additionally, the HPV type 6 and 11 are associated with about 90% of anal genital warts and are also associated with warts of the esophagus in newborns. really quickly. So I saw you had a bullet there about head and neck cancers and HPV. That's not currently part of the vaccine's indication, but what do we know about how well the vaccine might actually work with head and neck diseases related to HPV? It's true that we don't have a lot of data in the era of HPV vaccination to show that it will reduce the rates of those cancers because it's very clear that those cancers are etiologically responsible for the cancers. There's really strong circumstantial evidence to believe that the rates of those cancers will go down as a proportion of the population of vaccinated men and women goes up. So we need that information, but we think it's reasonable to assume that effective vaccination programs will affect not only cervical cancer and other anal genital cancers, but also pharyngeal cancer. 
So that's a nice segue to the section on vaccine recommendations and dosing. So like I said, there's, this is a triumph of contemporary technology, public health, and evidence that we can address sexually transmitted infections with vaccinations. In the United States today, there's one HP vaccine that's available. It's a nine-valent or non-avalent prophylactic HPV vaccine, so it's important to remember that it doesn't address existing infections. This is an extension of the quadrivalent vaccine that was introduced a number of years ago. Currently, it protects against seven oncogenic HPV types, particularly type 16 and 18, and the two non-oncogenic HPV types associated with genital warts, type 6 and 11. It's approved for several cancers, as we talked about. It's not approved for the prevention of oropharyngeal cancer, but it's also approved for the prevention of anal genital warts. And it's important to notice that in many vaccinated populations, clinicians never see anogenital warts anymore in younger populations as long as they've been vaccinated. In some countries where they have very high vaccination rates, the incidence of anogenital warts has gone close to zero. These vac this vaccine is now approved for ages 9 through 26 as well as ages 27 through 45. So particularly for those 9 through 26, it's approved and recommended for everyone, particularly. And so if individuals have missed vaccination before they became sexually active, it's still recommended that they get a full course of the vaccine to pick up any of the uh, types that they haven't been exposed to already. Although there are other vaccines available, there, the quadrivalent vaccine is no longer marketed in the U.S. as a, is a, vac, a bivalent vaccine that uh, is no longer marketed in the U.S. as well. It's recommended that these be given to all young people at around ages 11 to 12, as early as age nine. With any catch-up vaccination, it's important to remember that the vaccination series can be taken up at any time, even though um, there's been some interruption. And it's important to note that the expansion of the vaccine to ages 27 and 45 is particularly based on the idea of giving patients information. This doesn't apply to adolescents where it's recommended for everyone. These are the doses that are recommended currently, two doses, with, and it's important here that the second dose be given within 12 months, between six and 12 months after the first, and then the other doses as noted there. This is an extraordinarily effective vaccine for the prevention of, of infections. And the vaccines have been shown to have a high level of persistence for several years um, after the vaccination. Here are the keys to recommending HP vaccination in your, in your practice. Remember that currently we're not doing a particularly good job. We certainly could be doing better so that a lot of eligible people are not receiving this vaccination. And a major reason for that is the lack of recommendation from a primary care provider. The, there's a listing here for some tips on how to approach this. 
the most important one is a clear, affirmative, proactive recommendation from you as a primary care provider, as a critical piece of helping parents decide to have their children vaccinated for HPV. It's been shown that vaccination among young men is approximately two whole fold higher when the provider makes a recommendation like this. It's particularly important to remember that this recommendation holds particularly for people who haven't had sex for whatever reason, because they're too young, because that's the decision, under, with the understanding that at some point in their life, they will have sex. Giving the vaccine prior to exposure via sex is a critical part of making sure it's effective against all potential HPV infections. One key thing to stress is that this is a vaccination that prevents cancer, and it does so extraordinarily well. That this infection is so common that almost everybody gets it. So giving it before people start having sex is really the critical point of effective HPV control. This is a vaccine that has a really well-established safety and tolerance profile. And those are well-documented. And it's important to be able to be clear in your recommendation that this is the case. The other things that people have talked about are really the way you've present this, I think a direct statement of your recommendation is critical and making a point that it's a vaccine that's recommended as well as the several other vaccines that are usually targeted for 11 and 12 year olds. There are a lot of literature available online. The CDC has a particularly good one for talking with parents about vaccines as listed here. Dr. Fortenberry, you mentioned that in some countries with high vaccine uptake, they've seen remarkable decreases in HPV related diseases such as anogenital warts. And I, I think of Australia, which has a very robust national program and almost all of their vaccine eligible young people are, are, are covered. We're doing better in the US, but we still have a way to go, especially with young males. And I'm wondering, is there still something of a disconnect in the minds of not only the public, but of clinicians about HPV as, as a female centric infection, the vaccine is really more of a priority for females. Does that really play into, in, into the relatively low uptake of the vaccine with, with young boys? I think that's a reasonable perspective because this has often been seen as something to prevent cervical cancer and cervical cancer uh, as something that is a young woman's, is a woman's problem. It's minimized the importance of the infection for men as people who would transmit it. But I think it's important to remember that a number of cancers, genital cancers, penile cancers, anal rectal cancers, and as we now know, although it's not part of the recommend approved indication for the vaccine, oral pharyngeal cancers, those are all consequences of HPV infections that are targets for this vaccine. Dr. J. Dennis Fortenberry, thank you. I appreciate your time and your expertise. These, there's a lot to cover here, and I think we were both, well, you were certainly comprehensive and concise, so thank you for that. Um,
On the screen, you'll see links to a pair of websites, ASH's flagship site, along with our National Cervical Cancer Coalition. It's the program of ASH's that offers education, support, and advocacy for patients and survivors of cervical cancer. ASH's site, as I mentioned, has a section for healthcare providers. So again, just click the health providers tab on the home page, and you'll find links to a number of our past CE activities along with the selection of videos, counseling guides, STI testing recommendations, a lot of good materials, all of them freely available. So we encourage you to take advantage of those. And of course, this activity is located there too. And you can download the slides from today's presentation. Also, we have available, um, I'll click through, these are the, the, uh, the end notes. There is a link both here and on the landing page for this webinar where you can download the, uh, the citations as, as a PDF file. So. Dr. Fortenberry, thank you again, and thanks to everyone who's uh, watching this activity.